as a boy myself, just in the yard, yeah. I would toss a ball up in the air and play catch with myself. My father traveled yeah. a good deal and my sisters were, one was already gone and the other one was three years older and not terribly interested in sports. So I spent hours and hours, and I, I really think this is where I first became a writer. I built narratives about games mm. that were to be played that night. Um, I would do the entire narrative, of every pitch, every batter. It would take me hours. And then once in a while, when I would check the box score the next day, I would see that one of the things that I'd announced in my story had happened. Actually, oh, that's like, so cool. Like Mitchell Page hit a home run for the Oakland A's, like something yeah. really abstract. Yeah. But that really sank into me, this joy of making up a story and then maybe finding out that there's a little truth to it. And I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't a writer yet, but I definitely yeah. honed my storytelling early. Hello and welcome to Life Off Screen. You know, I think if I ask just about anybody, what is one of your top three family Christmas films, you're probably going to say Elf. Yeah. It's certainly one of ours. Well, if you're a big fan of Elf, uh, you're in for a treat today because uh, our, one of our guests on the show today is the producer of Elf, Todd Komarniki. Yeah. Uh, Todd is also a very prolific screenwriter. He, uh, oh, one of our favorites, he, he wrote the film uh, Sully yeah. with Tom Hanks. And he also heads up his uh, production company, A Guy Walks Into a Bar, which they have so many films yeah. uh, in development or on their, their slate. And uh, he's joined by his beautiful wife, Jane. Yes, Jane Bradbury. You may not know the name, but you may certainly recognize the face because Jane has a great story to tell all her own growing up in Ireland to walking the catwalks in Paris as a supermodel. So she has a great lens on life and their pilgrimage together is beautiful. Watching them together. I, I love how this couple interacts and how they value and treasure each other. This is uh, really a truly fun life off screen because here they are in their garage. Do it, you know, they're at, during COVID, they were here locally in, in uh, Santa Monica, right. uh, but live in New York normally. So it, it was a great time together. I think you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. So let's just jump right in with Todd and Jane. Todd and Jane, welcome. It is so good Hi. to see you. <laughs> this is so great. Thank you so much for joining us. This you're is welcome. a joy. I'm telling you, uh, well, being in COVID, Dan really misses his New York visits. Many times as off possible, he's been able to spend time with you, Todd. And, and one time, I got to come along, and I'll never get, forget where you took us to this quintessential New York restaurant. It had paneling, and it was beautiful, and we had this great, great chance to get to know you. And so we're looking forward to that again, hopefully. Yes, yes. But during COVID, we want to ask you how you guys holding up, what, what you've been doing. How's your kids? Um, that's all one thought, um, which is how our kids are doing is how we're doing. So um, Jane has taken over the homeschooling 100% and is everybody's hero. Mm -hmm. And when, when we started the pandemic last spring, we were all thrown in it together and we were trying to figure it out. And we were all just in one apartment in New York City, uh, 1,700 square feet, four people, no escape. And the mm -hmm. thought of death is sort of at your door. So that was yeah. a lot more tense. But we were lucky to escape to California for the back end of the pandemic. We've been here in Santa Monica since July, and Jane has proven to be teacher of the year, and she seems to be enjoying it too. Yeah. Thumbs up, right, Dashel? Thumbs up. Dashel, oh, yeah. how's your teacher? <laughs> uh, she's okay. Yeah, she's okay, yeah. huh? I'd say she's good. Her name is Coraline. Ah, that's the that's the online teacher. That's not the actual terrible, Dashel. Oh boy! So you have two two children, Remy and Dashel. Beautiful, beautiful. Hey, and I'm telling you, I'm I'm grand. We're grandma and grandpa to seven, and so um, I I had no problem volunteering for the Bible teacher, but nobody wants me doing math. <laughs> well, every time Jane Jane asks me for for help with math, assuming that I know, I, I just run for the hills. I was never yes. a math whiz. Da Dash was yeah. ahead of me in math. Yeah. Already. yeah. Oh yeah. Damn. It isn't crazy when you homeschool kids, you suddenly learn how little you know. It's pretty humiliating, <laughs> especially for me. I mean, yeah. Jane's getting to do science projects. She knows about weather and mitochondria, yeah. and yeah. she's she's a lot of uh, vocabulary words What's that I have to one? I have to look mm -hmm. up. 
That's for real. Yeah. But I find like that. that the kids, I've been really loving homeschool because I feel feel like they're actually learning a lot more with me than in school, than in public school. There's more time to do stuff, family time. And it's, yeah. it's, it's actually worked out really well. Todd, I, I want to go back to when you were a kid, um, what, what, what were you saying? You know, you were saying, I want to be when I grow up. What? Yeah, I, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Really? That's pretty much all I all I thought about. I mean, I played other sports, but it was yeah. all sports all the time. And you wanted to be a rock star. Well, that was later. She, oh, sorry. Little, <laughs> I, I wanted to be a rock star starting at 19. But as a boy myself, just in the yard, yeah. I would toss a ball up in the air and play catch with myself. My father traveled yeah. a good deal and my sisters were, one was already gone and the other one was three years older and not terribly interested in sports. So I spent hours and hours, and I, I really think this is where I first became a writer. I built narratives about games mm-hmm. that were to be played that night. Um, I would do the entire narrative, every pitch, every batter. It would take me hours. And then once in a while, when I would check the box score the next day, I would see that one of the things that I'd announced in my story had happened. Actually, oh, that's like, so cool. Like Mitchell Page hit a home run for the Oakland A's, like something yeah. really abstract. Yeah. But that really sank into me this joy of making up a story and then maybe finding out that there's a little truth to it. And I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't a writer yet, but I definitely yeah. honed my storytelling early. Yeah. Wow. How cool. Now, now, so when did it kind of develop? How old were you when you said, I think I could do this for a living. This is something I really want to pursue. Yeah. That only happened at the end. My last year in college when I fell in love with writing and, mm. you know, I, 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 didn't think I qualified to be a real writer. I didn't think I'd had enough writing under my uh, hood, but I (laughs) believe that the lie that a lot of young people believe that the easy way into the movie business is to be a screenwriter because that's not, that's not real writing. You know, that's what I told myself. Um, It's it's harder having written three books and plays and all these other things. uh, Screenwriting is the hardest of all the writing. So I'm I'm glad if I'd known that up front, I probably would have avoided it. I wasn't I wasn't ready for the discipline it required quite. Or the disappointment. Oh, (laughs) disappointment. Talk about the disappointment. Especially as writer. I mean, there's feast, famine, drought of being a writer because not everything you write gets produced. Oh, yes. very, very little, very little. Yeah. No, I've always said, I mean, I remember at my 50th or 40th or every birthday I've had since I met Jane, um, when someone is your co-dreamer, but they are not doing the, the work, you know, we're not co-writers, but she's my co-dreamer. Mm-hmm. She she yeah. suffers the biggest slings and arrows because mm-hmm. she doesn't have the joy of making the work, but she has the pain of having the work not happen. Oh, good point. And uh I've really grown to empathize with that pain and the courage it takes to trust your partner to go farm in that way. It's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's not yeah. this uh, help meet uh, cheerleader. It's, it's none of that. It's actually a giant skill that mm. takes all of oneself. And so, uh, you know, I remain daily grateful for, for Jane's yeah. uh, steadfastness. Yeah. Dan has written uh I guess 80% of what you've written or more hasn't seen the light of day. Yeah. But I, it's on my I, hard drive. I, I, that's pretty good. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, 80% is pretty good. And you know, yeah. the first 15 years of our marriage, we toured off, he toured off of his own material, eight albums and all that as a comedy writer. And so we were really grateful to do that, but the, you think you're on this trajectory and then cricket for years. Yeah. You know, just, and, 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 you know, you are, Turning over the topsoil, you, you, I mean, you own your theology, you, you drill into your identity, you have each other to remind each other of the faithfulness of God over and over the stones of remembrance. Well, didn't God say, and remember this. And so, wow. With even someone at the level of you, what what you've pulled off, that's pretty remarkable. You grew up in Ireland. You were the daughter of a baker in Ireland, right? So I just want to know how did you get from there to the, the the catwalks of Paris as a model? Tell me about that. Um, so I was in college, and my sister entered me in. Uh, it's called the four. It was a Ford Supermodel of the World competition, and I was representing Ireland and. 
and then that was it. And I went to the competition in Florida. And well, you left out the part that you won Ireland. Yeah, I was representing Ireland. <laughs> oh, I won that's Ireland. Really big. Yeah, that's a pretty Ireland. big thing to leave out. Wow. She skips the winning it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so there was a representative from every country in the world, and yeah. I was the Irish representative. And I didn't actually place really in the competition, mm-hmm. but then when I came back. Forward was saying, you know, do you want to come to Paris? And then that was then the next week I started. I moved to Paris and started. Oh my goodness! And you said your sister entered you. Yeah, Were you a part of that? No, um, I didn't have any. Int- I had no thought to be a model. It wasn't like mm-hmm. now. Um, and then my sister said, "Oh, we should do pictures." And then she took these like snapshots with a tiny camera and we got them developed in the pharmacy and oh my uh, yeah that was the beginning yeah and how did you get to new york wow. oh because i was living in paris and i wasn't really enjoying it it was um it was kind of isolating and mm. It was, I had already been there three years and wow. you have to really pan the pavement. Like every day you have to go out for hours with your book, mm. trying to get jobs. Mm. So I had done three years of that. So I was oh, really wow. over it. And then an agency in New York said, oh, you know, we'd like Jane to come to New York. And I was like, brilliant. And then as soon as I got to New York, I started working straight away and I didn't have to go on the subway every day <laughs> wow. take yeah, the, taxis, and that was it and I loved it different, th- different than the metro <laughs> everywhere so many weirdos on the metro <laughs> you had a quote that talked about you were just hungry a lot yeah a lot. yeah and, and if you didn't have time to exercise or just a busy day yeah. it just meant to go without food you know to yeah. under eat and that kind of broke my heart now the business has changed because they're having more models of you know regular size and mm-hmm. different variations of sizes Mm -hmm. but when I modeled and I used to do runway you had to be super skinny and Mm -hmm. um and then you travel so much that you and also in the 90s people didn't exercise like they do now so Mm -hmm. it wasn't you know there wasn't much going to the gym (laughs) yeah (laughs) now now both of your faith journeys really began uh prior to meeting right Tell, tell us about your, your individual faith journeys. Well, my, mine really began uh, by abandoning my faith. I mean, that was, that was really where it started for me. How I, so? Well, I grew up going to church, and I, I sort of treated church as a competition, like every other competition. So I was always first in Bible drill, and I like to say that I knew all the stories and, but it was just an ego driven thing. You know, I didn't know it was ego driven yeah. looking back. It was completely ego driven. And I realized how out of touch I was with what was actually happening where my senior year in high school, we were coming back from church and I had the church bulletin in my hand and I saw at the top, it said 11 o'clock worship service as if I'd never seen that word before in my life. And I asked my parents, why do they call it a worship service? That, that to me is the doorway into where I was like that yeah. was church was something you did on Sunday, like yeah. watching the Waltons on Thursday night. You just did church. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. the way it was. And it was comforting. And my parents were amazing and loving, but it was not mine. Mm-hmm. And when I went to college, uh, it took about 11 minutes for it to begin to fade. And then by Christmas of my freshman year, it, w- it was gone. It, it was mm-hmm. gone to the point where. I was Mm. certain that there was no God, there was no Jesus. It was all a ruse and um, and that life was meaningless. And it happened within like, I don't know, a day and a half, like falling off a cliff and seeing the world. You know, when you're that age already, you think, you know, everything. Yeah, everything. But, But seeing the world as I fully believed it now to be, you know, revealed that there was no meaning revealed and that everybody else was caught in this this false story, this lie, Um, what that does, first of all, terrifies you inside because it cuts you off from the, your maker. But second of all, it, um, it makes you really arrogant because you need to plant the flag of your certainty now, not knowing that you are putting more faith in nothingness than you ever put in God and that you're building a new religion out of your panic. 
Mm-hmm. But of course, there's a, a rent comes due on that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. yeah, everything, everything went black for me for a number of years. And it was only after passing through that pitch blackness that I finally had, uh, you know, a shaft of light find me. And, and, you know, Jesus had been with me the whole time, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I only discovered actual faith on the other side of that when I was, say, 21, 22. Wow. How'd that come about? What was, you, you said uh, the flash of light. What, what, what was that? It wasn't, it wasn't an instant. It was just getting rescued continually over those period of years mm-hmm. when I was trying mm-hmm. to not be here anymore. And the mm-hmm. things that God was doing and, and putting in my, in my way to protect me and, and show me love. And I think he just wore me out. Mm-hmm. And the, um, the actual moment that the beginning of it was, I, I came home to my apartment and I noticed on my bookshelf, I had my uh, living Bible from when I was a kid. And I brought it with me to college and it was sort of weathered and the binding was loose. But when I saw the Bible there, I got really, really angry because I was so angry about the lie of it. And so I took the Bible and I put it behind a bunch of books. so I wouldn't have to look at it. But of course, when I looked at the bookshelf where it was hidden, I knew it was there and I became increasingly angry. So finally, one night I came home and I took the book out from its hiding place and I stood over a trash can, one of those industrial green trash cans that all elementary school kids remember. And um, I stood over the trash can to throw the Bible away. And while I was standing there, I I thought inside, um, can you actually throw a Bible away? Almost to the point where if I go to put this in the trash, will it come out of the trash? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other part was, can you undo this? If, Mm. if, if If you throw this out, is there any way back? And so I didn't throw it out. And I went and sat on the edge of my bed. I put the Bible on my lap and I said to the God I did not believe in, mm-hmm. if this is the truth and I open this and read this, you better come through. I was, you know, shouting at the God I didn't believe in. Um, and of course, like always, uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And he didn't let me down. And it's been 33 years of uh, walking with him since. Wow, I never knew that story. That's that's wonderful. You know, similarly, um, and I'll tell, I'll tell very quick, but um, Dan's story is so beautiful in the sense that he went to church growing up. His parents kind of dropped him off and let them do Sunday school and then picked him up. Yeah, or VBS. And a wonderfully it. loving family. But um, later on, uh, at a, you know, just kind of feeling lost and he felt this word to read your Bible, read your Bible. And he went and dug it out. I mean, it's this little thing he got from way back when all he could remember is, is the red where Jesus talked. So he just opened it up to the most, and it's a red. sermon on the Mount, most read that he could find and blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs of the kingdom of God and fell on his face and yeah. just no one witnessed to him. No one shared. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm sure through the course of growing up, but it was one of those things where he had just taken it. And it, I mean, it was digging out to find out where is this old Bible? I only had one yeah. given to me my whole life. So isn't it amazing how God yeah. finds you? Well, Jane, were you in despair? Were you despairing that you went to No, my- no, Jane, I, things were great. I, I, I was with my comedy group playing uh, comedy clubs and we were Breaking being considered in. for Saturday Night Live and we were opening for Lily Tomlin and we were doing really well. I had great friends. I was happy as can be. I just felt this emptiness. Yeah. And I and I the same voice that a year later would say, read your Bibles, said, find God, find God. That fateful night, I, you know, I heard that voice, read your Bible. Mm-hmm. And, it, it, you know, God is so faithful. He he's so desires relationship with us he'll do whatever he'll use any kind of means to draw us Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. back to him and uh it was was beautiful jane i looking at um your story Mm -hmm. um was is it uh oh i should just ask you instead of what i'm curious about but tell me yours tell us yours um well, I grew up Catholic. We all, being Irish, we all, you know, mm-hmm. were Me confirmation, too. communion. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always had, you know, that basis of understanding and study. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in my teenage years, you know, kind of fell out of fashion. And I was like, <laughs> uh but it wasn't only, it was more after when, 
like in my early twenties when I was going through a difficult time mm. and I was living in Europe and I would spend time going into churches around Europe and, um, and I just, I just felt like I was being taken care of. Yeah. I needed God and God came and delivered and, um, and then that was it. And, you know, we didn't really read the Bible growing up and, you know, it was more of something you did out of, you know, routine. Um, Mm -hmm. But nobody can take away, you know, when you really believe, nobody can take away that from you, Mm -hmm. regardless if, if, um, you know, the church does awful things or... (laughs) In, or, you know, you're betrayed by people you thought you know, had a faith or mm-hmm. you know, deep, deep inside, you, you know, there's a conviction because you know how many times God th- showed up for you in times when you really, really needed him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, in your story, um, was it 1998 that you found yourself auditioning for a role and met somebody special? Mm-hmm. <laughs> She didn't yeah. think it was special at the time. No, no. no. It, was slow break. it wasn't, it wasn't love at first sight. Huh? No, slow breaking wave. Um, <laughs> but it's actually a, a blessing yeah. because we had a chance to build a real friendship, which is which is the bedrock of any long-term oh, relationship, yeah. and certainly marriage. Yeah. If, if, if you don't know how to laugh with each other and at each other yeah. and and recognize how ridiculous we are as human beings, it, uh, yeah, that's you know, right. Yeah. You're not going to get far if you're trying to do it right or be cool or all that stuff is just pretense. It's just it, it's an overlayer that yeah. keeps people from seeing the truth. So mm-hmm. you choose by God's grace to spend your life with your best friend and the person that mm-hmm. gets to know everything about you and see all your mm-hmm. foibles. And I mean, yeah. even even recently, mm-hmm. I'm 55 years old and I, you know, you think the older you get, um, the less sinning you do or the less mm-hmm. poor decisions you make. And, um, you know, I've had to learn recently just through humility of, of confessing, Hey, I got something really wrong and I need your grace, Jane. And, and so mm-hmm. her, her grace absorbed my sin. You know, mm-hmm. I, I didn't yeah. cheat on her. It's not, it's not yeah. a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not a, this is not no. a confession, but the point is I did something I, I shouldn't have done mm-hmm. and I needed grace. I needed forgiveness. And I also needed to be okay with the fact that I could screw up at this point to, to yeah. that level. And remarkably, um, before I talked to Jane about it, I was, I was, had an outsized fear because sin always leads to fear and feeling mm-hmm. alone. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that it would go really badly when, when I, when I told her and instead she was so compassionate and mm-hmm. understanding and kind that it taught me five more lessons that I, that I needed to learn. So I'm just, yes. I'm just always learning from, from my wife T- today. She said, Hey, we have uh, 45 minutes. The kids are with their tutor. Let's go to the beach. Cause she goes swimming every day when we're in California. And I had a lot of reasons to not go, mm-hmm. but it was stupid to not go. And I said, I'm not going to go. And she said, it's okay. You don't have to go. And she's getting in the car. But, um, I definitely felt a nudge from the Holy spirit. Just like get your butt in the car. <laughs> yeah. Going. And of course, the fruits of our time together this morning were beautiful. And we were in God's nature and swimming and, and laughing and, and salty kisses in the sea and just everything that is good and, and sweet in life. Yeah. But another reminder that you have to say yes to those things. Yeah, yeah being, have, in, being intentional. Stay, yeah, and you have to stay mm-hmm. open and you have to listen to your partner because we get so convinced that the way we see the world is the proper way of viewing the world. Mm-hmm. And that's why we have disagreements with each other. We fight because, well, you don't see it. My well, I, yeah, I was mad that Todd didn't hook Todd because Todd was arranging this, you know, this interview. And I was really mad that Todd, that we're sitting in the garage with, you know, with a horrendous background. <laughs> and I'm like mad with Todd. I'm like, why didn't you not set this up? This is, you know, and that happened like what, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we're, we're loving it because it's life off screen and we don't care about the right. polished. Yeah. But it's go, just going, the back, best. going back to your time about that, that's so true in marriage of, you know, so the, you know, the old adage is opposites attract. That's not always true, but there are certainly some things. Mm-hmm. And one of my weaknesses is sometimes I plan things out too much. I'm too, 
uh, scheduled and looking down the road, uh, future oriented, and I'm not as spontaneous where Peggy's extremely spontaneous. <laughs> and so through 43 years of marriage, we're learning mm. how to, I'm learning how to be more spontaneous, yeah. you know, spontaneous. She's learning to kind of, okay, let's, you know, make the best use of your time. Well, even, you know, even ba- boundaries and, uh-huh. um, you know, all those things that are, uh, have been so good for me, the margins. And uh, so, and I, uh, it tickles me to no end to see him uh, want to jump in the water with me um, again and again. But it's crazy that you can be together because we're together 22 years and you can still be learning and hashing out these things. And then you still feel like, I still feel like Todd is new every day, like who he is discovering him is new every day because every circumstances we come across, new circumstances is a mm-hmm. new situation. So yeah. Yeah. if you're alive and open, you mm-hmm. know, you have this unending kind of um, discovery discovery and yeah. fascination. I, 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 well, now one project you did get made was a very little obscure film. I don't know whatever happened to it called Elf. Elf. And a foreign, uh, foreign movie only released in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on a digital platform. And Jane, you were Buddy the Elf's mother. You were in it. She squares. She's Buddy the Elf's mother for all time. It's a all huge time. Yes, there I'm, is no movie without you. And you didn't have to go through childbirth. <laughs> Right, Susan Wells. I know you've been asked a billion times, but how how did that project come about and get that incredibly good cast? So few projects get developed and actually made. So I thought I need to be producing as well. I need to open up more story streams of things to happen. So I formed a partnership with a young movie executive that I knew, John Berg. I brought him into my production company, Guy Walks New and Bar. And he was managing at that time three writers, I think, just three. One of them was David Berenbaum. And David Berenbaum had written three scripts at that point, and they were all Christmas movies. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of them was Elf. So we had the opportunity to put the movie together and uh, assemble the team. We chased down Will Ferrell and we hired Will uh, with John Favreau and we got the movie set up at New Line and you know, it took years and years and years, seven years, start to finish. Wow. From when David wrote it. And then uh, it came out and it made a, a tiny splash. Yeah. Yeah. I, a, a tiny, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely on probably every family in America's top three Christmas films. And uh, I know in our home, uh, it, you know, our kids quoted it ad nauseum mm-hmm. and now our grandkids quoted uh, ad nauseum. I was touched that for my daughter's 10th birthday at the sleepover, she requested that the movie be Elf. That was one of the, I, really? I know she's seen it before then, mm-hmm. but it's not really a dominant thing in our house. So they're not running around quoting lines or, I mean, you're more likely to hear brace for impact in my house. Yeah. Than you are oh, yeah. hear, uh... This is the captain. Brace for impact. <laughs> to hear, um, buddy, head down, head down, brace yeah. for impact. Oh my goodness. Well, um, our grandkids, um, you were so fun because um, uh, one time we were out with them and I don't know where we were actually going out to the, the movies and there was this big escalator and they all did it. We oh, all please. spread their legs. We the, took a picture. Wow. We, Dan sent it to I you. I sent it to you. And, and you just, wrote back, Elf Scalator. Elf Scalator. So, oh, good. Well, that's good. Uh, At least I was funny in response. Another time that was really kind of funny is that I was um, I was speaking at a mother's daughter event. So it was a, at a big, nice, fancy hotel. And um, after it was done, uh, of course, I brought my daughter with me. We went into the bathrooms and everything was gorgeous and big. And so I'm in... I can see that he's, she's in the stall next to me. So I take the opportunity to climb up on top of the thing and pull up. And I said, these toilets are ginormous. <laughs> but here's the kicker. And, she still had the mic on. And uh, to, can you believe that? Uh, how, how old was your daughter? She oh, was 30. No, yeah, right? yeah, less, a little bit less than maybe 25. Less, 25. But yeah. she was mortified really the only person busting up is the sound man because he had it on <laughs> but it was just like with That's a, hysterical how fun was that for you i mean you i mean you've got comedy icons i mean was it just hysterical do you have any stories to tell well just that, that bob newhart never stops talking yeah. and everybody would just circle around him 
the thing is, Will is brilliant in the movie, but he's the kind of comedian that is a little more circumspect. He'll he'll mm-hmm. at a, at a dinner he'll say three things. They'll all be the funniest things of the night. But he doesn't need the spotlight. He's mm-hmm. you know, doesn't seek it. Bob Newhart doesn't need the spotlight either. He talks in a, just above a mumble. But yeah. every story about Don Rickles and Frank Sinatra oh. and about just mm-hmm. um, real showbiz in the fifties and sixties, he was he was the guy that we all wanted to hang out with. And, yeah. and yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Kahn had great stories too. Just mm-hmm. um, and I loved yeah. learning from him. But Bob is just one of the all time sweethearts. Actually, there's a whole thing on Netflix, not not to cut you off short, yeah. but if anybody's really interested, there on Netflix they did a series just this Christmas and it's uh Christmas movies Christmas, that made us. Yeah, Christmas movies that made us and it's a whole interview. Oh, gotta see it. With Todd, and it's really funny, you know, Todd and the producers, and it's actually it's it's kind of a skit, but it's it's really funny. Yeah, it's it's yeah. mostly it's mostly true. They they spun it in a certain <laughs> direction to help them have the fun. Why do you think um, that Elf resonates so much with families to to such a classic degree? I think there's one reason that ninety nine percent of the comedies that come out in America are comedies of humiliation. Mm. Um, The sitcoms, somebody's dumb, Mm -hmm. the husband, the son, Mm -hmm. um, there's always the brunt of the joke, sort of a setup as um, what I would call kick in the crotch comedy, which is so dominant on on YouTube, just when people send videos and somebody being humiliated and laughing Mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. And the bulk of our feature film comedies that, that Hollywood produces are the same. Mm-hmm. And Elf stands alone because it's not a mm-hmm. comedy of humiliation. Yeah. It's a comedy about light winds. Yeah. It's a comedy about how the one who's seemingly at risk actually changes everybody around them. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the uh, and the little mini journey that Buddy goes on, you know, because he has loss and disappointment with his dad. Yeah. So it makes him grow. He's fully human, mm-hmm. but it's it's such a, a quick pivot because of forgiveness. Yeah. The scene where James Kahn says in Central Park, I'm, I'm sorry I ever said that to you. I, you know, I love you. I, I love being your dad. And the immediacy with which it's received mm. and the hug and then the overlong hug, you know, yeah. Buddy is restored to his full light so quickly mm. yeah. because he has the opportunity to forgive. And he's yeah. such a sweet little character, isn't he? I mean, yeah, he's so absolutely. like innocent and pure and yes, without guile. And right. he's just really, yes, that's it. And he's, it doesn't seem like he's acting it. It, it just, he truly yeah. tapped into something that was really precious. Yes. Well, you, 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 guys, you, you guys are, are touching on it. One of the things I just, I so love about that film is I see the virtues of God's kingdom, Mm -hmm. goodness, kindness, forgiveness, family, um, all these things on such beautiful display, Mm -hmm. you know, wrapped with a big Christmas bow. And, (laughs) you know, it, it just, in a good way, it reeks of the kingdom of God. Hey, we hope you're enjoying our conversation with Todd Komarniki and Jane Bradbury. We just kept talking and talking and they said some real gems. So we thought, you know what? We're just going to save this for a part two. So join us next time as we continue our conversation with Todd and Jane. Thank you for joining us for Life Off Screen with Dan and Peggy Ruppel. Life Off Screen is produced by Master Media International. Our technical director is Jason Rugg. Please subscribe to the Life Off Screen YouTube channel or subscribe to the Life Off Screen podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave your comments in the comment section. And to find out more about Master Media, go to mastermedia.com. Thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you next time.